The following story has been brought to you by storiestoinspire.org. One Friday, we pulled in with the minivan. A great tzaddik, a rabbi by the name of the Kaal of Harebi, who's from Bnei Brak in Israel. He's a Holocaust survivor. You might know his face from the pictures of the great rabbis. He's the only rabbi, one of the only rabbis in Israel, that doesn't have a beard. He has two or three little straggly hairs coming off of his chin. The Nazis, Yamachim, he was in Auschwitz. He's a Holocaust survivor. And they literally ripped the beard out of his face just to taunt him as a young rabbi. He had many miracles that happened to him. He was actually put into the gas chamber. He was the last one put into the gas chamber. And when the Nazi closed the door, the door kept popping open. And the Nazi was so angry because they were so precise with such precision that they said, it's impossible that we counted wrong. And we know that the gas chamber, stuffed in as sardines, holds exactly a certain amount of people. It can't be we're off by one. They were so precise with such precision. But yet, every time they closed the door, it popped open. He got so angry, the Nazi guard, that he grabbed the first man that was standing inside the door, which was the Kalva Rebbe, pulled him out, and then slammed the door, and this time it locked. And the Nazi turns to the Kalva Rebbe and says, your God loves you. Go back to the barracks. The Kalva Rebbe came to Brooklyn. And at that time, he wasn't so close with the community. They didn't know him yet at that time. So years ago, many years ago. So he was looking for a place to stay. He ended up going to my in-laws. And they actually handed him over the house. And for those 10 days that he stayed there, the house became Grand Central Station. Day and night, the phone didn't stop ringing. People were coming back and forth by the hundreds. Their living room turned into a waiting room. The rabbi sat in the dining room and closed the doors. And he accepted people for blessings one at a time. We came in Friday. And you would think Friday, you know, Friday, nothing doing. The house was packed with people waiting to get the rabbi's blessing. The rabbi's blessing was powerful. It was really amazing. I mean, the blessings he gave to people were like fantastic. I came into the house with the suitcases and I'm making my way through the people. And just then, a lady from our community comes walking into the house and she's, she's bawling, crying. And I turned around, I said, everything okay? She goes to my father and she tells me, she tells him, I just came from the hospital. She's got terrible news. I must see the rabbi. Now, ladies, when you go to see a rabbi, there's a waiting room, a lot of people waiting, but there's a difference between an emergency and a blessing. Everyone was okay with, it's an emergency, they saw the lady, she was crying her heart out. So they let her in right away. It's only one problem. She did not speak a word of Hebrew or Yiddish. The rabbi, on the other hand, at least at that time, didn't really speak English. I mean, his English was so-so, but not enough to converse. How are they going to speak to each other? So... We need an interpreter. I said, oh boy. Went into the room. I sat down next to the rabbi and the lady started crying. And she said, rabbi, I just came from the hospital. They just found a growth, a tumor in my stomach. It got so big that the doctor said, spread. They can't remove it. It's too late. They're giving me 30 days to live. Now I'm sitting there like, whoa, get me out of here. This is not what I signed up for. I looked at the rabbi. I told him what she said. The rabbi leans back and looks at the lady. He yawns. He yawns a second time. He's yawning a second time. And then he looks at me and he smiles and he says to me, ask her, does she keep Shabbat? Ask her, does she like Shabbat candles? Does she keep Shabbat in her home? I felt very uncomfortable. I don't want to put her on the spot. So I turned to her and I said, well, the rabbi wants to know about your religious observance. And she said, I heard him say the word Shabbat. I said, okay, you want to hear it? He wants to know that you keep Shabbat, do you like him? So she looks down and she says, you know, when the kids were young, when they were still home, we used to keep Shabbat perfect. My husband, he shut the store on Shabbat. Me, I lit candles. I cooked a whole week for Shabbat. We kept Shabbat the way Shabbat was supposed to be honored, respected, perfect. But then the kids grew up and they, they left the house. Just me and my husband. Things got so boring. We kind of fell out of it. So now my husband went back to work on Shabbat. And me, I uh, don't really keep it anymore. Sometimes when the kids come over, holidays will do it, but that's it. So I turned to the rabbi, and I told him what she said. So the rabbi looked at me with a smile, and he told me in Yiddish, Zogir, tell her that if she takes upon herself to keep Shabbat, to light candles, if her husband agrees to stop working in the store on Shabbat, that she's going to end up laughing at the doctors. Now, you need really big shoulders to say a statement like that. I said to the rabbi, you sure you want me to tell her to just, he says, just like that. I turned back to her. I buried my head down. I was, I was so uncomfortable. 
And I said, the rabbi said, that if you accept upon yourself Shabbat, and you keep it, and your husband keeps it, and you start lighting candles, and then the rabbi pipes in, at least three weeks. Okay. At least three weeks, he said. He says, you're going to laugh at the doctor. She said, what? That's what he said. She got very strong. She stood up, and she turned to me and says, tell the rabbi I accept. I turned to the rabbi, I said, he mikabel it, she accepts. The rabbi smiled, he blessed her, he, he, he nodded, he yawned again, <laughs> and she left. And that was it. And I thought that was the end of the story. That was that. I ran out of there so fast, I cannot tell you. All they needed was another interpreter. I was done. I, I ran upstairs. I said, I'm in the shower, and I don't want to hear from anybody. About a month later, we drive into Brooklyn, and I come into my in-laws' house. And I'm coming upstairs, bring the suitcases up, and there's a doorbell rings. I hear on the intercom, uh, Dovi, come down here. Someone wants to talk to you. I come running downstairs. And there's the lady. And you had to see her. She was dancing. She was crying. She was laughing. She didn't know what to do with herself. I said, hey, how are you? What's going on? She says, oh, yeah, you're the guy. That... I said, yeah, that's right. Hmm. What's going on? Tell me. She says, is the rabbi here? I said, no. The rabbi lives in Israel. <laughs> he already went back almost two weeks ago. But tell me what happened. She says, I'll tell you. She says, you're not going to believe this. But I came home that week. And I told my husband, Marty, we're doing Shabbat like the old days, like when the kids were here. He says, I lit the candles. He agreed. He did not go into work. He closed the store on Shabbat for the next three weeks. And today, I just went to the hospital on a routine checkup. I don't know what possessed the doctor. The doctor walks in and looks at me and says, I want to take another CAT scan. I want to make sure that what we're doing is right. Before we start treatments, although I don't think it's going to work, but I want to make sure we have this right. She says, I don't know what possessed him. It wasn't on my chart. Out of nowhere, two minutes later, they come in, they take me off. They take CAT scans, the entire area. She says, right after that, about an hour later, the doctor comes running into my room and his face is white. She says, the guy looked like he saw a ghost. His jaw was on the floor and he was speaking gibberish. She said, he couldn't. This is a very highfalutin doctor in NYU. This was a top guy in his field. She said, the guy was talking like Elmer Fudd. That's all, folks. That's literally the way he was talking. And she says, get it out. What, what, what's going on? And he turned to me and he said, you don't have a cancerous tumor in your stomach. You're six weeks pregnant. Oh, goodness. <laughs> six weeks pregnant. Seems like they read the stand out. <laughs> she says, boy, did I laugh at the doctors. <laughs> Shabbat. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. Enjoyed this story? Come again. Bring a friend. Stories to inspire.org.